We are live. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wednesday, September the 8th, 2021 special board meeting for the Colton County School District. I would like to call the meeting to order. Thank you to everyone that's in attendance and thank you to all those that are watching this recorded session. At this time, I ask everyone to please stand for the pledge, followed by the invocation by Reverend Jenkins. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. It's great to respond to come today thanking you for another privilege and another opportunity. Thank you, dear God, just for the Colton County School District, the parents, the students, the staff, the administration. As we come together today, dear God, because we are looking at some times now, dear God, but we realize that you're still in your charge and we turn all of our fears over to you now, that you will help us make the right decision that will be the betterment of our children. Bless these blessings in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll begin this afternoon's meeting with public input. And we're grateful that we have some parents and stakeholders that are here with us today. The board welcomes the opportunity for you to share information concerning the district. Here are some guidelines for addressing the board. There is nothing in the law or anyone here to prevent you from saying anything you wish. Please try to refrain from commenting on any pending student or employee, discipline or grievance matter. What you say will become public information which is sub subject to the Freedom of Information Act laws. If you choose to call specific employee names, we suggest that you do, do not. It is the board's chairman's duty to inform you that you could also be subject to defamation laws according to your statements. Present your comments without using offensive language or making comments in a disrespectful manner. School district policy allows you three minutes for comments. Board members and the superintendent are not required to respond to your comments unless they choose and you can end, we can end your response if they wish. Thank you for completing those cards as you came in. And at this time, I would like to call Crystal forward to the podium. If you would, please just hit the button at the bottom, and that, that way it turns on the microphone. Crystal, if you would please come forward. Mr. Dale Shirell is our um, timekeeper, and she's over here to my left. If you'll um, note, She'll give you some notice when your time is almost up, okay? Um, all I have to say is I think that parents need to have a choice, whether they are masked or unmasked, whether they are virtual or not. We have parents that, that fully believe that they should wear masks. That's, that's them. We have parents that don't want them. We have children that have asthma and can't breathe with masks on. There are, there are medical reasons why kids can't do it. Um, virtual, if, if the schools are, if the schools feel it is unsafe for the children to be in there without a mask on, then they should not have the schools open. It should be virtual. Um, it's all of the parents' choice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
comment, they will have a chance to ask a question again for right another month. Um, and one of the concerns is because many of the board members, somebody wrote a letter that was sent to a board member, but some of the board members do not have contact emails and people are having a hard time to Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, I ask that Chantique Givens please come forward, Ms. Givens.
provide options for every person to make the decision that is best for them. You have great resources at your disposal by hiring a superintendent with a history in administrating a virtual program. She knows how to administer the curriculum. Use that to offer virtual to those that are posed to greater risk by COVID. For those like my family that are more concerned about the psychological and neurological development of our children and the issues that virtual presents them, those kids need to be back in school. The human interaction is essential to every aspect of our health, both physical and mental. For years now, you all have fought so hard for inclusion for all that you have placed yourselves in the political arena at crossroads. You can continue to forge this unconstitutional path that is ultimately segregating our students by political and economic status. Or you can humble yourselves to get back to the basics, math, English, history. Focus on providing education. That is all we want. According to a recent NDPC study, which I'm happy to leave with you all to review, it was very informative, our average population will double and triple in size across all grade levels along the longer that schools are interrupted. Illness and death, stop and go school closures, outside of school hardships, and less than effective virtual is negatively impacting an entire generation of students. These kids will present a new set of academic, behavioral, and trauma impacted educational challenges that you all have never imagined. This is not some groundbreaking realization, folks. This is common sense. Not to mention our teachers, staff, and administrators that have had their professional and personal lives upended, facing new challenges with each and every closure and every opening. Mask or no mask, that's a parent's choice. Without 100% participation and accurately fitting each mask, mask or using the correct material, as we've already talked about, the efficiency is insignificant. You are merely wasting resources, increasing the anxiety, and killing the morale of our students and, and employees. We are losing our teachers to charter and private schools and some students that are fortunate enough to have that option. 20 seconds. Those schools are enjoying athletic events, their students are thriving, their morale is up, their academic center is focused, and it shows. Parents are choosing whether they want to vaccinate their children or not. If they want it, they certainly don't have to be incentivized to do so. They do it because they believe it to be in the best interest of their children. They, those that are not getting vaccinated also believe they are doing what is in their best interest will not be swayed by incentive of any kind. To think they would be is simply demeaning. I literally have 30 more seconds. If we continue down this path of district-wide virtual, we will increase our average population of students, increase our alternative school enrollments, drastically increase dropout rates, sending negative effects all through our community by limiting our workforce, increasing crime and teenage pregnancy, discouraging industry and economic growth, and the list goes on. Tonight, I ask you all to get back to the basics. Tonight, I, I remind you all, as your policy reads, that the schools exist for the benefit of the students and the community. That the public schools belong to the people who created them by consent and support them by taxation. Thank you, Ms. Hall. You need to get back to the basics. Give us the option. Let us use the structure, the routine, and the discipline that works for our children. Thank you, Ms. Hall. At this time, I'll call on Tracy Yocum. If you will, please be reminded that Michelle is on my left, and she'll let you know the three-minute time limit that we have. Um, if you will kindly respect the time that the board has, we appreciate the comments that you're sharing. My name is Tracy Yocum. I have a son that has autism. He has hearing problems. He has pica, which you all should know what pica is. He picks things up and he puts them in his mouth. I have sat last year with him all year while he homeschooled because I didn't want him in the school building where he could pick up something and put it in his mouth or get it in his hands and bring it home to my husband that has a tracheotomy that as soon as it comes home, it goes in his lungs. I want you all to please bring back the choice. I understand there's parents out here, they want to send their kids back. My daughter's one of them. I want to be able to keep my son home. I want to keep him safe. I don't want to lose him, and I don't want to lose my husband. But there is one thing that I do ask for the teachers, because I sat there all year and I watched. Don't give the teacher virtual and in person, because they can only do one job at a time. And yes, I've had two awesome teachers, two 
two awesome teachers. I have an awesome one this year. And I'm just asking everybody, if these, kids, these parents want to let their kids go back, let them go back. But give, them a, give us back our choice. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose my family. And I understand y'all have a job to teach our kids. And yeah, my son gets lonely because he doesn't have John Blow or this one to play with. But he's got a neighborhood of kids that he is playing with. So they're still all together. But I mean, we're all, when I say that, maybe I'm going over my own words, but where I live, we're a close-knit family. We don't let these other kids come in. We're just a little, a little family. And but to send my son to school without a mask, or, or, and my son has hearing aids, he has glasses, and that gentleman knows what I'm talking about, it's hard. Now, now put a hearing aid on your ear. Would it be hard for you to wear all that? And I'm not asking a question. Just think about it. Thank you. Next, we'll have Ms. Jody Lees. Please come forward. Give Ms. Shirelle is on my left, and she'll remind you of the time.
Um, he was hurt for all last year. I'm told now I don't have the option. He has to go back to school. I live with a 70 something year old parent. I'm in my 40s. If he brings something home to one of us, you know, I'm all he got. If it's not me or my mom, it's nobody else. Um, another concern is, I know, you know, it's like, you got some people for the mask, some people not for the mask. Can we just, please just do what's right for the kids? What's right for the kids? I know we all as adults have our own personal beliefs, political beliefs, but what's right for these children? What's going to be best for them? They're more resilient than um, we give them, uh, you know, acknowledgement for. Yes, I know they lost a lot academically, um, but they also gained some. This is a generation of technology learning children. We just got to find the people and train them how to do it, if that's what we have to do. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Ms. Good. And thank you to everyone that provided comment. Uh, this board acknowledges the concerns that you share, and we also acknowledge the challenges that in school during COVID times. Um, it's been a challenge for us all, and so your participation tonight is, is appreciated, um, and we hope that you'll stay around for the remainder of the meeting to get all the updates that we have. Um, excuse me, I got here late, and I didn't know that you had to... There's a form at the entrance if you'll, if you'll fill it out. The time frame has already changed. I mean, it's already passed. Uh, I apologize. Um, well, you leave your comments. And my child, so I would really like to speak. You certainly may leave your information on the form, but I can't allow what I didn't allow for everybody else. Thank you. At this time, I'll um, ask the, for the superintendent's update and the transition from virtual to in-person learning by the Valerie K. The forms at the beginning of the entrance there.
our school nurse can clearly take what is just a moment. She goes above and beyond to meet the needs of our students and staff. She works diligently and he never has a complaint about the work that she does. She has been super supportive of students, parents, and staff while dealing with the overwhelming concerns that we all face. She doesn't mind calling parents when needed or going the extra mile to ensure that we are doing what's best for students. We know that her job is very important to us at Bells Elementary School and we greatly appreciate all that she does to keep us going. Black Street Early Childhood Center Principal Tiffany Pearson described her school nurse, Talasia Hill, in this way. Nurse Hill is a true blessing at Black Street Early Childhood Center. She always has a smile and kind word to shake. Her calming presence and ability to manage the many tasks thrown her way during this pandemic are incredible. She cares about not only our students, but our staff as well. She always makes herself available and never complains. Nurse Hill is a rock star. The Carlton County High School administrative team said this about Carlton County High School nurses, Deborah Daniels and Kimberly McElroy. Our team of Nurse Daniels and Nurse McElroy have been amazing this year and have helped everyone at CCHS. These two ladies have worked tirelessly all the while remaining positive and calm in this uncertain and volatile situation. There has never been a time that the role of the school nurse has been so impactful on the day-to-day -day operations of the school. In the midst of students returning to the building and having to implement our COVID-19 safety measures, their professional expertise has been essential to our faculty, staff, and families. They are also valuable members of our school core MTSS team and have served in this role wholeheartedly even though their time is stretched to the max. Thank you, ladies. We are lucky to have you both on our team. Colton County Middle School Principal Warren B. said this of her school nurses, Amanda Frank and Linda Brown. Where to even begin in talking about how these two amazing women support Colton County Middle School? The nurses who serve Colton County Middle School will go above and beyond to provide excellent care to our students and staff. From putting on band-aids, stopping bloody noses, and holding ice packs, Nurse Frank and Nurse Frank tirelessly provide you for all who make their way to the nurse's office and on it. These past few weeks have proven to be one of the most stressful times for our nurses due to the constant care and assessment of our students and staff in an unprecedented time of a pandemic, while constantly knowing that the health and wellness of our school is held in their hands. Nurse Frank and Nurse Frank handle all that come their way with care, grace, and professionalism. We are so very thankful to have them as part of our CCMS family and look up to them as they are truly on the front line. Cottageville Elementary School Principal Tashina Allen had this to say of her school's nurse, Dawn Waddell. Nurse Waddell is a constant presence in the lives of our students, faculty, and families. She is caring and compassionate towards all students and staff. She takes the time to build relationships and focuses on the whole child, not just particular injuries or illnesses. Nurse Waddell can be found providing health services throughout the day. She evaluates students for COVID-19 symptoms and exposure routinely. Nurse Waddell believes in educating the staff, students, parents, and community partners on COVID-19 prevention strategies. She reminds us all that our mental health and well-being is just as important as our physical health. Cogsville Elementary School appreciates the passion, love, and support she offers to everyone. Forest Hills Elementary School Principal Wilson Hamilton said this of her school nurse, Angie Gillison. We are so appreciative of the dedication that nurse Angie Gillison Place and caring for our Cooper Cubs. Nurse Gillison also works hard to educate and motivate our staff to earn wellness points for Forest Hills Elementary. She has coordinated wellness walks as well as work in the school garden. We are grateful for her courageous efforts day in and day out, especially through the COVID era. Hendersonville Elementary School Principal Joseph Hall said this of his school's nurse, Sonia Nettles. Ms. Nettles is a school nurse at Hendersonville Elementary. She is in her first year and is a wonderful addition to the Hendersonville Elementary School family. Her prior experience has been working in the medical field at Colton Medical Center. In the short time that she has been here, 
Nurse Meadows has proven to be a hard worker and dedicated to the well-being of staff and students. Nurse Meadows is our hero. Northside Elementary School Principal Catherine Benchett has this to say about school nurse Melissa West. Melissa West is constantly looking for ways to improve the health and well-being of all Northside faculty, staff, and students. She chairs the Health and Wellness Committee and assists with creating opportunities for supporting not only the physical health, but the mental and emotional health of our Northside family. Her role since the fall of 2020 has demanded far more than in previous years, but she is meticulous in keeping daily records of COVID-14 positive and isolated students and personnel. She assists with daily temperature monitoring and is constantly in touch with parents regarding questions they have regarding COVID protocols. She is a true hero in the medical field, and we are extremely thankful to have Nurse West as a member of our Northside family. Thunderbolt Career and Technology Center Director William May had this to say about this facility's nurse, Judea Pryor. Judea Pryor has been an awesome addition the faculty and staff of TCTC. When she assumed her role here during the 2020-2021 school year, she was able to help create an effective system for screening both adults and students as they entered the building, and she set up an effective nurse's office and student isolation room. In school year 2021-2022, she has been instrumental in maintaining efficient records on quarantine students. Her conversations with both faculty and students display professionalism, while at the same time building a great rapport with others. She is a major asset to TCTC. Mine too. Oh, hello. I forgot um, before we begin public comment, I'm sorry to interrupt, that Mr. Tim Mabry, board member, is um, joining us via phone. Mr. Mabry, can you please say hello? Hello. Thank you. I'm so sorry I did not mention that earlier, but I wanted to all those, especially those that uh, provide a public comment, to know that that board member was also hearing your words. So thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting.
state to see whether or not we are approved. I have had a conversation with the state superintendent as well as with our deputy superintendent for teaching and learning to see whether or not we are allowed to be able to move to a virtual option. So it's not as easy as it sounds to be able just to move and transition back and forth. We want to be able to make that, um, you aware of that. So we still continue to require masks in our schools. We continue to encourage vaccinations. As you can see, we offer several vaccination clinics um, throughout the school year. We continue to be able to offer those vaccination clinics. We can offer the vaccination incentive for all of our eligible employees as well as our students. We have a commitment to quality education, whether or not they're virtual or whether they're in person. And we continue to, to, to um, offer that option for our students. Safety and sanitation protocols, we continue to provide those. I'll go more in detail about those in a few moments. And then our COVID leave has been extended to December. And then we're exploring the options for virtual learning. Several of the um, speakers that came up, um, it's a good opportunity for me to be able to address that at this time, if you will allow me. When I became superintendent on July 1st, the virtual option was already for us to be a member of the Low Country Consortium. Uh, I accepted that opportunity. Um, it was already closed in April, as one of the parents um, denoted. But since the arrival, I do realize that children do need the option to be able to be virtual or to be able to be in person. But that option is not my decision alone. That option is to be approved by the state. So I took it upon myself to reach out to the state to see whether or not that opportunity still presented itself. If you'll know the proviso, proviso 1.108 requires by law for us to be able to offer a virtual option if we so desire for our students, but we can only have 5% of our students in that virtual option. And I'll turn to my chief financial officer for her to provide me that number. How many students would be allowed to be in a virtual option if I decided to go to that option today. 245. Only 245 children out of 5,300 students would be able to be in the virtual option according to the state. So I would have to divide that option up between K through 12 for all of those students. Currently, we have how many students in the virtual option, Ms. Williams? Currently, we have 39 kids in the Low Country virtual option. Right. And we have 40 kids in the South Carolina so I would have to subtract those numbers from the 240 students that I would be able to have, and then I would be able to open up an option. So it's not that I don't want to offer a virtual option for my children. I have to live within what the state requires for the children to be able to be in the option. So what I have done is I'm pulling together a team so that we can look at opening the virtual option for those children. But it has to be state board approved and the state board needs September 14th, we're too late for that one, but it meets again October 17th. Hopefully we'll make it by that term. We'll wait for them to vote, see whether or not we can open it up for the students to be able to make it. Wanted you to be aware of those. Let's move to COVID updates to say things. We're having additional testing for our students as well as our faculty. Um, we're considering moving our quarantine based upon DHEC guidance. Right now, we do 14 days. DHEC does allow you to do various options, but for the safety of the students in the building, if you're vaccinated, it allows you to have various different types of options. So we're considering moving from the 14 day to the 10 day because that would allow for me to have more students in school at a given time without having to quarantine so many at one time. Okay? And then we're employing a sub-nurse so that that sub-nurse can help with contact tracing. That sub-nurse can all, all, also be able to help with calling our parents when we have to quarantine students because you see our nurses are very overworked being able to contact trace, being able to make sure that they do the temperature checks and working with all of the students, not just for COVID, but for our children who are diabetic, our children who have other health care needs, they're overwhelmed being able to do that. So I'm hiring a contract nurse to be able to take care of those, those additional needs. And then the 
continue to offer our vaccination clinics on a weekly basis, and then examining the opportunity to offer fortitude pay for our nurses who are working overtime. Their day does not end at 4 o'clock or 4.30, because oftentimes the contact tracing continues through the evening when they have to examine the seating, the seating, the, the seating charts from all the buses and the seating charts from the classrooms, they contact with all of those parents. So the work of a school nurse does not end. I have to be able to compensate them who are going above and beyond to be able to take care of our students. So if I can draw your attention to our numbers, while we have had to go to virtual for two weeks, our numbers were at a point where we needed to do that. Our bus drivers could not safely transport our students. But now, because we have gone to a virtual for two weeks, our numbers have come down. So if I draw your attention, I know it's a little small for the entire audience to see. Hopefully you'll be able to see it on the corresponding monitors there. But right now, we have 167 positive cases. And then um, school totals, we have um, 41 there. You can see how they each column each day and how we have um, provided those numbers for you. Our curriculum and instruction updates are returned to in-person. It is extremely important for our children to continue to learn. Children have to become productive citizens so that they can have the opportunity to give back, they can have the opportunity to continue life, and they can have the opportunity to become successful adults. So we have to make some adjustments. We had to extend our time for our grades and our assignments to September 17th. So let me explain what that means. Our students, some of them have internet connection at home, and some of them don't have internet connection at home. Those students who don't have internet connection at home, and those students who are unable to log in, we're not counting that against them because we put them in an emergency closure. Those children have the opportunity complete all of their assignments and get those assignments turned in by September 17th. Just because they did not get it done on the day that it was due, we have extended that opportunity to September 17th. They have to have everything turned in. So because that extension occurs, we've also extended some other days. It would be unfair to a parent and a child to send home an interim progress report at the time of September 17th. 16th, I believe it was September 16th, as it was on our original calendar. So today I granted permission to be able to extend that opportunity to September 21st. It allows the teacher time to grade the, the children time to turn in the assignments, then the teacher time to grade the assignments, get them into our school, and then send the interim progress report home on September 23rd. So all children can be successful. That's the goal for every child. Our teachers continue to work on their pacing guides and get those updated. We've had a major session today with our middle and high school. We hired a, 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 a consultant that will come in and make sure that all of our children and all of our pacing guides for our teachers are on track so that they're able to um, meet those state guidelines because we do not want our schools to be on a priority list. That's my goal. And then math testing will be will begin September 14th through the 24th. We had to make that adjustment because we went to virtual learning. So, so that all children would have the opportunity to be back in school a day, get adjusted to be back in school, and then go to the virtual, go to the, um, the math testing. And then our parent conferences, while they were originally scheduled for September 16th, we're not moving that day. We're continuing to have those parent conferences. The school will reach out to those reach out to those parents for those particular parent conferences. So we continue to be diligent of, um, about um, curriculum and instruction and making sure our children are ready to return and provide those accommodations for their return. Our operations update, we continue to provide sanitation and deep cleaning for all of our schools. Additional desk shields were ordered for all of the schools as well as for um, the quads are in all of our cafeterias. We have provided water bottles for every student. 
Um, it's there. They can go to the office, ask for a water bottle. A water bottle will be given to them. We provide one for every single child in this district. Masks are provided for all students and staff who wanted them. Hand sanitizers in all of our buildings. Our buses and our schools are daily deep cleans. And then we do temperature checks every single day. Now, let's talk about the expenditures, since there's a big conversation about how we spend the money. So expenditures. We've had lots of money spent on sanitation. All of that money came out of ESSER 2, or ESSER 1. I have provided the outline here of how much money that has been spent for um, all of our sanitation, our PPE supplies, spent in encumbered. Um, we've provided air filters, sanitation, cleaning materials, as well as, you know, we have to give our, 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 our portion to the private schools as well. So we provided that, um, our equitable services, air purifiers to our classrooms, as well as district offices, thermometers, hand sanitizer sprayers for buses, um, as well as our fluid victory sprayers and sanitizing wipes. So you see the total there, which is $111,944.60, and then $889,180.85, and all those purchases are building the grants. Okay? And that's out of the $2,547,354 that we received out of ESSA 1, and then out of ESSA 2, we only spent, we budgeted $170,160.16. And, and, um, and we have not um, spent that money yet. We have ordered some additional but we have an eight invoice, that's why they live in your I've also provided you an itemization that you should have. I'm um, not just giving you the chart, but I've given you all of the pages so you can see the itemized list by list, the quantity, as well as the number that was ordered, and probably the location in which it is. All right, let's continue. And I think we're at the end. Any questions from the board for me? I do have one question. Uh, yes, sir. There are shields that were ordered. Are they optional? Are they required for each student? The death shields are not an option. The death shields are required in every single classroom. If there is a parental concern with the death shield, that parent can reach out to the school and they'll make accommodations. So the death shields should be in every single classroom with every single student. Okay. Thank you. I got one question. Yes, sir. With, with the fact that um, children under 12 can't take the vaccine and we going back, you know, planning on going back to school, how are we going to handle, handle that situation? Okay, we need to handle the situation in terms of keeping, keeping them safe. Keeping them safe, we're going to do as much social distancing as we possibly can. We're going to have the death shield, have the death quad, we're going to continue to sanitize. We're going to continue to sanitize the playgrounds in between, and um, we're going to continue to wear masks. So all the wise directed. Yes, sir. I just want to say thank you for everything that you guys have done, taking the time out to make sure that we can provide a safe and education for our children in Houghton County. I just want to say thank you. I do not take the job like I have three grandchildren of mine. Two of them are in school every single day. Not not here, but they are in school every single day. And they are wear masks to school every single day. And they are subjected to the COVID virus every single day. So I come to school every single day with them on my heart and the children in this district on my heart because I have a passion for being able to do this job. I don't want to see one single child Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Do you have an update on bus drivers as far as those that are quarantined and those that will be back with us on Monday? Um, I'll get that for you. As far as I know, all of my bus drivers will be back, but okay. I will have that for you. I'll give it to you in executive session this morning. I'm here to make sure that's in that question, but I will definitely have you. Um, Ms. Williams, could you reach out to Mr. Warren and ask him that question about bus drivers for me so that I can back for a session? Thank you. Sure. 
Any other questions for Dr. K? Well, we're ready for Mike. Okay. Uh, Dr. K, I just want to make sure that, um, that this board supports the administrative effort to return to school on Monday, 9-13, um, from our virtual learning environment back to face-to-face. -to -face. And we'd like to request that the board, if there was a motion in support of the administration, um, re re recommending that we return back to school face-to-face -face this Monday, 9-13. And I think we also want to tell parents who does not want their kids um, back in school that, like Dr. Kate said, she is working towards making that happen for you. Um, we are doing the best that we can for the children of Palatine County, you know, so we just hope that you believe and trust in that. Is there a motion to support the effort to return back to school face to face 913? At this time, I make a motion that we allow the superintendent to return us back to in person learning on September the 13th, 2021. Second motion. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Dr. King, I just wanted to ask the question, and I know it's starting to rain outside, it's hard to hear, but I wanted to ask if the, uh, what the threshold might be for parents to understand another return to virtual, and if there be any other considerations by the district for another learning model. Um, there's not enough consideration for the district for another learning model at this time. If we could look at any learning model, it would be a hybrid model, but we are not looking Is there any discussion? 
All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Mr. Mayford? Aye. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we're in, in, entering into executive session. For those that uh, are watching, please know that there will be a second part. And for those that are present, know that we will return. Thank you.